it has to begin, I think, uh, with parents. I think it has to begin with antenatal care, with, with prenatal care. No, prenatal care. You know, I think midwives play an incredibly important role because when, when uh, women are pregnant, they're very receptive to healthy information about the developing child, as are the, the fathers, actually. Uh, I, I remember sitting through the prenatal classes for my own children, fascinated by the information, but the information that was missing was the information about sugar intake, about exercise, healthy nutrition. Um, I always say, and it's true, my, my two daughters have never ever been to McDonald's to eat a meal. And my eldest one is nearly 12 and the younger one is nearly nine. And uh, at first this was something that they were a little bit embarrassed about. Now they're very proud about it and they have no interest. No, they've never tried it and they have no interest anymore uh, because they see what old-fashioned dad is saying about obesity levels increasing. They, they look around them and they see this happening and it becomes real. And I think the other frontline workforce that's incredibly important that we need to engage with are the pharmacists. You know, because patients often go to the pharmacist because they're frightened of going to the dentist. And they say, I have toothache or my gums are bleeding, what do I do about it? And we're very bad at giving information to pharmacists about um, oral health, how to improve oral health, what are the right products to recommend, why should we be recommending them. And I think we need to start thinking about um, educating pharmacy students and qualified pharmacists and educating midwives. So the message doesn't just come from the dental profession directly, it comes from other really important professionals within healthcare. Uh, and if the message is given early, then I think parents will listen and they will at least try to uh, engage with healthy uh, nutrition uh, and, and healthy lifestyle. And then the final component, I'm afraid, is the government. Uh, because sadly, healthy nutrition is too expensive. It's too expensive to buy fruit, it's too expensive to buy vegetables, it's very cheap to buy refined starch foods, uh, biscuits, uh, burgers, white bread, stodgy white bread. Uh, and this is a real problem because, um, of course, it all boils down to socioeconomic status, how much people can afford. What do you do if you have a low income and you can't afford the fruits and the vegetables? You know, that's just a disaster. So you're taking the people that, that really can't afford to buy the fruits and vegetables, who already have challenging lifestyles. It's maybe they can't afford to visit dentists or can't afford for their children to visit dentists. So they have this double hit. And I think we need to look more about redressing the social balance there, maybe less on, on financial rewards and maybe more on real meaningful rewards, such as providing free fruit and vegetables at school for, for those groups who have the low uh, social income that can't afford to buy the healthy nutrition. Uh, we can't blame the parents. It may just be they can't afford to, to buy those, those, uh, those foods. I think that's a real challenge. But where are the oral health programs in schools? Children listen. Uh, and if you do it in a way that engages the children, not only do they listen, but they find it fun, they find it exciting, and they find it interesting. Whatever happened to the, you know, the oral health promotion in schools? Maybe teachers should be supervising toothbrushing in children before the first lesson starts in the day. Well, in the UK, we, we used to have um, a community dental service, the school dentist. And the role of the school dentist was to examine children in schools and to diagnose disease and then to provide the treatment for the disease. Um, wouldn't it be nice to reintroduce that but in a different way, i.e. to prevent the disease before it develops? So actually, and it doesn't have to be the dentist. We, you know, the nurse can be trained in oral health education. Patients do listen to hygienists because hygienists are very good educators. And patients will share things with hygienists that they won't share with a dentist because there's less of a barrier there. Uh, it's hard to explain why, it's just a fact. I, I find things out from my hygienists about patients that they, patients don't necessarily tell me, which is really important and really valuable. So it's a team approach and sharing 
the knowledge about the patient in a professional way, confidentially within, within the, the team, can actually help you deliver different solutions for patients. Uh, but I, I would love to see a, a public health programme where the young dentists or maybe the young dentist with a hygienist goes into schools. How much does it take? You know, if you have a one hour, maybe a 30 minute lesson once a year, just to give a, an engaging message to the school kids, it will go in and they will just think twice about certain aspects of their lifestyle. Children um, in schools these days have um, uh, sex education given at a much younger age than they ever used to because of the risks of teenage pregnancy. Um, and this is a really important part of school education now. The responsibility is passed to the teachers. It's very difficult for teachers to do this and sometimes they bring experts in uh, to, to help them do that. Um, similarly with drugs, um, recreational drug use. There are programs in certain parts of the world that, that will provide education on, on and why drugs are bad news and, and what the risks are and, 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 and just in a gentle way introduce this at a young age um, so that uh, hopefully the message gets through in a, in a, in a non-embarrassing way. You know, if, if you have the conversations, the sex education conversations before the children are going through puberty and you do it in a very simple, gentle way, in an appropriate way, then they're less embarrassed when they're teenagers and it's not such a big issue for them. And the core messages that have been delivered very carefully r remain with them. I think it's a great idea and I would strongly, I would strongly support it. I think it translates human biology into reality. Something tangible. Yeah, it's too theoretical. But if you translate it to something that's tangible that, uh, that the pupils can see happening and can understand, it makes it real. Um, and that translation of the theory, of the education, of the science, that translation um, into something that students, pupils, patients, public can, can grasp, I think is so important and we're really bad at doing it. Public health funding systems generally do not pay for prevention. And the time that you spend talking to a patient as a professional, particularly as a dental care professional, the time you spend investigating the patient, the time you spend making the diagnosis, and the time you spend planning their treatment is not paid for. The only thing that's paid for is the physical intervention. And we have to get away from this. Uh, it's, a, it's a surgical model. It's incredibly out of date. And the medical model, which is the model of, um, if you like, wellness. It's a capitation model. So here is a population of patients. Your job is to look after those patients. Then if you do your job well and you prevent the disease, then actually you have to do less intervention. And it then becomes cheaper. So the incentive for the physician is, well, if you prevent disease, your life gets easier. You have less disease to treat. Uh, and your patients are going to be healthier. And it's a very different way of thinking and a very different way of funding healthcare. And it's something that dentistry has never uh, engaged with. Not because the professions never wanted to, but because in fact the public health providers, the people that commission the services, have never thought that way. They've always thought, well, let's just treat this disease. Let's sort the pain out. It's always about repair and it's not about prevention. And we, we can't afford to do that anymore. Populations aging, all diseases are becoming uh, more prevalent because we're keeping teeth for longer. Patients are not prepared to have teeth taken out anymore. They want to keep their teeth. So there's a lot more disease to be treating. And uh, the only way we can afford to do this is to actually prevent it happening in the first place. That's a long journey.